Welcome to a special episode of the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. It's just myself and our CEO, Nate Pearson, today, and we're going to be talking all about adaptive training because it's a big day, Nate. It's it's, it's launch day. It's yes. live. So exciting. <laughs> I know. It's been a while. Big day. Yeah. I know. And the audio will sound a bit different. Nate's in a different location today but we are here to answer all the questions that you have about adaptive training. So if you've joined us live, if you've been to the trainer road forum, if you've gone on Instagram and followed trainer road and you've seen us asking for questions, we've been compiling all of those questions, finding the best ways to answer those questions, getting all the information you need. But of course, everybody that's joining us live, you can send in those questions that you have to the YouTube chat and we'll be able to answer them as we go through this. Uh, but first Nate, I know a lot of people are probably going like, I already know all about adaptive training. I've been using it. It's awesome, but there are plenty of people that ha have not actually started using adaptive training, might not even know what it is. So we should probably give them the basics, right? Um, we should describe why we built it first, right? Yeah, I, I have something else I have to say, getting out of my head. I oh, yeah. usually don't have you so big on my screen and you look so good on this <laughs> when oh, it's thanks. just you all big. Good vibes. Like your lighting is perfect. <laughs> it's very cool. It sounds like, it feels like you're right here. Okay, so why do we build adaptive training? Adaptive training, like came up, this idea has been around for a long time. Uh, back in like early 2011, 2012, I knew this was part of Trainer Road's future. That's why I say it's been a long time. Like that was the vision back then to be able to do this. And the, what, what we needed is a system that responds to your performance. Because one, not everyone's the same. So there's a lot of studies that show like, you know, bell curve and what makes people faster. And uh, we can make training plans around those, but that's, that's really a bell curve, right? And if you fall on the outside, it probably isn't the most awful way to train. Two, though, this is the big one, is life happens all the time and things change and you're not a robot and you can't just nail your plan all the time. And we've, over the years on the podcast, that's been a big part of the podcast is we've helped people understand what you can do in order to, to adjust that when life happens, change things. Uh, but we needed it to scale and we still would have so many questions of people of how can I change this? I, 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 I missed this workout or I didn't do well, or I, I performed really well in this workout. How should my plan change? How should my fitness evolve? And adaptive training is in direct response with that is what can we do is as you perform, how does that then change your plan? Uh, as your goals change, how does that change your plan? Uh, as life gets in the way you get sick, you travel, how does that change your plan in the future? And also though, how then do we, train Jonathan's specific physiology, which is different than mine. He might respond differently to VO2 max intervals than I will. And we, I might respond differently to a 65 year old man or woman. Uh, all of those things are baked into adaptive training and that's why we built it. Yeah, absolutely. It's with the existing, everything that we had in place before with plan builder and everything else, we got really good at training people, uh, making them faster and doing so within that bell curve. This allows us to extend beyond that. But then, like you said, everybody that resides within the bell curve drifts in and out of it just because of life happening. So yeah, it allows us to be able to train people as individuals. Uh, it's awesome. And we should talk a bit, little bit about how it works. Um, how, what are the basics, Nate? Yeah, the basics are that while you work out afterwards, we have a, a machine learning, which is just a, it's a, a, a part of AI that analyzes your workouts. And then based on that, it uh, updates your training plan. Uh, or if you're not on a training plan, I'm sorry, what it does is adjust your levels. And we can talk more about levels of how it's like a profile of how well you perform as an athlete. And then that then drives your training plan, or if you use train now and stuff in the future. Um, also though, if you skip a workout, you don't have to complete a workout. So if you miss a workout, um, or if you don't perform well in a workout that gets fed into the system and then it updates again too. This is really like, um, uh, a way that, you want to take out like confusion into the process of like, what should I do next? Or if I didn't do this perfectly right, or if I perform too well or not too well, but you know, over the target or under the target, what happens? And a lot of times it's hard to understand. Um, and that's what adaptive training is supposed to do to be able to make it so that it takes that confusion away. You just have confidence in the system that, Hey, I'm going to get the right workout every time and I can move forward uh, and just do what it sells. Yeah. And it's two most, like the two most basic components of this are objective input and subjective input. Mm. The objective input is how you do on your workout, right? We're able to see the power data compared to what you were supposed to do. And as a result, our system analyzes your rides with machine learning algorithms that we've been training and will continue to train forever. So then we get this really deep analysis of how you did. And then we ask you with these surveys, this is where the subjective part comes in. We ask you with these surveys thereafter, how the workout felt. 
And even though that seems really simple, the combining of those two things is really powerful. And it allows us to be able to make the right changes and then you get the right workout every time. And that's really what the goal is. And that's kind of what it feels like. Uh, it's, it's cool because in one respect, you'd think that this is going to be super complicated because really it is very complicated in terms of what has gone into developing it, but it's so, so easy to use, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's so easy to use because you just do your workouts, you fill out the surveys and then it says, here are your adaptations and it, it's that easy. So uh, it's that objective performance data, the subjective feedback that we get from you as an athlete. And it allows you to be trained as an individual. Super cool. Yeah, for those for those who don't know that survey, it's a uh, if you uh, do the workout and everything's as planned, you get a one through five of how hard it was. One being easy, five being an all out effort. And uh, inside of that, as long as it's not uh, as long as you're consistent in your responses and you uh, like, it's I don't we don't get into this right now, Jonathan, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about so we should. Yeah. Yeah. Why not the response to this? Cause there's confusion of like, well, how do I say what a workout should be? This was a VO two max workout and it was easier than I thought it would be. It was still really hard. Do I say it's easy or do I say it's all out or like, or hard? I don't, I don't understanding. And what it is, is just, how is that workout feel? Not how you expected it to feel. So for me, I do a VO two max workout. It is almost always hard or very hard. And sometimes all out and all out means like I had nothing left to give. I could not give anymore. And I think we've all felt this in a race capacity. You're like, well, I've never felt this at a trainer would work out. That's probably a good thing. Like you don't have to have that all out thing all the time, but a very hard, um, for me personally, when I think of very hard is like, man, I do not want to do another interval. I might be able to, but I really don't want to. And for me, hard is like, I could do more intervals. Uh, but it's what, what is important about the system is you stay consistent and we're looking for big shifts. So if you do a VO two max workout and you say it was easy, Adapt training is going to say, you are way off the target right here. We're going to push your levels. So we're going to make you advance faster in VO2 max until we find something where it starts to be difficult for you because a hard day should be hard. Um, opposite, if you have an easy day and you're like, it's an easy 30 minute spin and it becomes very hard, well, something else is going on, right? And that's going to feed into the system too. So uh, that is, that's the nice part of it. And then also, if you don't finish to work out early. We need to know that information and it will send you, uh, we'll ask you, why didn't you finish early? Because if you just stop a workout, we don't know if it's, you didn't have enough time was like a kid crying or, uh, did you just give up? Like, did you not have the mental energy? And there's a whole bunch of questions in there. Do you feel sick? Did your equipment break? Um, there's a lot of things that could happen and we all, we need that information too, in order to push this system forward, uh, and get more, uh, data into it. And, and also to know how to change your, um, your training plan. Cause there's a big difference. If you're doing a VO two max workout and you just don't have enough time to finish, then this was soul crushing. And I only got through 30 minutes cause I could not go any farther. Yeah, absolutely. And, and once again, re reiterating what you said, don't overcomplicate it. It's just how the workout felt. It's not how it felt in relation to anything else. It's just how it felt. So if it feels really hard that day, then it's hard. If it feels easy that day, then it's easy. It's just how it feels. Um, a lot of people are like, should I yeah, comment on how it felt at the end of the workout or halfway through it? Like one, no, it just, how did it feel? If you look back at it, how did it feel? Uh, simplifying it really helps you make it more consistent over time too. So you don't have to go so deep into the weeds. Yeah. And you're not going to mess it up by like one. Like yeah. It, there's no, it should be no stress on this. It should just be like in the moment. Oh, that felt hard. Okay. And then you move forward. Answering a four instead of a three doesn't mean that your training is going to go 180 degrees away, right? Yeah, um, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's built uh, It's built to be able to handle all that. Let's talk a bit about the beta process and what we've done. So um, the development process in and of itself, many times you start out with an alpha, you go to a beta, and then you go to production. But that there's, there's finer resolution within all of that, right? In the sense that the beta usually has different, pro uh, different steps to it. And for us, we had a private beta. And that was what everybody signed up for when we announced this back, I think in February of last year, which is super exciting. Well, we had before uh, that, we used it for like oh, six yeah. months, seven, eight <laughs> yes. months. Like, I mean, more than that, but, but when, when it was actually in a state that we could personally use it, it was a long time. Yeah. So we used it there. Then we opened up the beta so that people could sign up. And then we did mm -hmm. a staged rollout. Uh, what's the point of doing the staged rollout, Nate? Yeah, the stage rollout is so we have we have a lot of users um, and our athletes. <laughs> and what can happen is if you open the floodgates, you can overwhelm your uh, both your like technical processing system 
and you can overwhelm employees because if you have a, a huge bug, you could have, let's say, thousands of people sending in support tickets in the same hour. And we have, we have a lot of employees, but we don't have that many employees. And we're not going to be able to, to handle that. And then the engineers get this pressure of this needs to be fixed right away. And the product managers. And then marketing's like, you're killing our brand. Oh, my God. And it, it is this, <laughs> it's this unnecessary way to be able to open up to everyone at once. Even though I think with this product, like a lot of people um, have been super duper excited about it. And they want it in so fast. And I feel that with people. And I understand because um, I, I mean, no one wants it out faster than I do, I think, in the world. So I, I feel that wanting to come out, but that's why we did it in slow stepped phases is because um, we did have bugs. We had some bugs that like, actually, I think we had like a hundred people on it and we took down our own site and we fixed it, but because of the <laughs> processing and you can imagine if we had tens of thousands of people on it, how that would have handled it or how, what would have happened to, uh, to our site. So that's why, I mean, we're human and we're, we, we had to do a step process and that's the most efficient way. But we also learned things during that process about uh, we got, we improved the product because we got feedback. So we could look at, look at little groups, change something, improve it, get the feedback. And then also, uh, and then it's next group kind of refine it and uh, understand it more. So that's, that's the way that um, I think trainer likes to do software releases where it's stepped in small gates. We add more people and more people, and more people. I can understand though. It's frustrating. You kind of want to, the ideal way is it gets fully baked. You don't hear about it. And then on the launch day, you can fully experience it because then you don't have to wait. And it's very, very exciting. Uh, I don't, until we get much, much bigger and have a better system on that, I don't think that's going to happen just to set expectations. For sure. Yep. Yeah. This is how the development process works. Um, and overwhelmingly the feedback and the improvement that we've seen from athletes has been super positive. It's really exciting. I want to share some data behind that too. Uh, some stuff that we can share here. So roughly 25% of trainer road athletes trained with adaptive training during the beta period. It's important to keep in mind that beta periods aren't meant to replicate at full scale, right? They're supposed to give you the sample size sufficient to be able to improve the product, right? So with that, some cool data points with this, um, athletes that have enabled adaptive training have seen a 50% increase or sorry, 50% decrease in failed workouts year over year. So, so if what's I a failed workout? Yeah. So that's a workout where you weren't able to complete it because it was just too difficult. Right. Um, came to a stop partway through, uh, weren't able to finish the intervals and to put that in greater context. If I was training last year without adaptive training, and then this year I was training with adaptive training, that data says that I had, would have a 50% decrease in the amount of workouts that I failed. Consistency is one of the most driving metrics with training that we see in helping people get faster. So this is a huge, huge improvement for our athletes. And let me explain more too why that's so important is the reduction in failed workouts. And that's even if you turn down the workout a ton, right? Or you start skipping intervals, you take breaks in intervals. And our system too, you might our system is smart enough to know that if you just skip one or you do a little bit of a break, it's not going to air quotes fail you. Like there's, there's, there's a room in there and there's, there's ones that workouts that completely crush you. And those are the ones we're trying to detect. Uh, but inside of this, like what would happen is because people would take breaks or, um, maybe, uh, the, the VO two max to ramp test, uh, ratio for you is outside of that bell curve that you got challenged too much on those workouts and that's why you would then fail those or you would actually pick a workout from the library we sell this a lot and all workouts aren't the same just because you have an ftp doesn't mean you can do uh mm -hmm. every single workout in every single energy zone right away yeah. um and that's what we have in the level system that we can expl explain later but we actively try to guide people away from workouts that they're not ready for so you get an ftp and maybe you start with 10 minutes at threshold intervals and you work your way up and you can work your way all the way up to an hour at threshold. And I, I just did that in my Cape Epic preparation. Uh, but a lot of people can't just do an FTP test. That's not an actual hour test. And then express that um, immediately over all their energy systems uh, and be banging three minute repeats at a uh, VO2 max repeats at 120 with like very little rest. That's another thing that you, you want to train up. So by doing this and having the system uh adjust, you get a lot less failed workouts and then you don't get crushed. Your motivation is a lot higher. If you really get those hard days that are hard, but not all out and you have some rest days, training is so much easier. You actually get faster, faster, and it is not, uh, it doesn't become a slog. 
and uh, reminding people of the mechanics of how this works. You do your workouts, you fill out the survey, you get adaptations, and then your training plan constantly improves and adjusts to you, right? So another data point with this is that adapted workouts, meaning workouts on your calendar that adaptive training has not adjusted versus those that it has adjusted. So uh, keep that in mind. Adaptive workouts have a 38% lower failure rates than non-adapted workouts. So that's also showing that down the road, when adaptive training makes changes to your training, it's, it's also, there's like a compounding effect of the fact that not only are you failing less workouts, but then the ones that you're getting suggested also have a much, or have greater odds for success, which is what you want to know, right? Yeah. Those adaptations that you're getting, you want to have confidence that it's going to improve your odds at getting faster and getting the right workout at the right time. Exciting. I, I always um, think about this, John, when I explained it is it's like, if you're lifting weights and you're trying to bench press 150 pounds and you can't do it. Well, other plans will have you, and even our previous plans will be like, well, next week we're going to do 170 or 160. <laughs> yeah. And so well, I can't do 150 and then it can compound on each other. And that's the way people fall off training plans and training altogether is by it, not adjusting to your performance every time. Uh, and that's again, one of the many aspects that we wanted to improve inside of uh, trainer road. For sure. Another one. So athletes with adaptive training enabled <clears throat> were 20% more likely to increase their watt for their watts, care, watts per kilogram or their power to weight ratio. So that's huge. That's a, that's an awesome improvement to see that increase in likelihood. I want to add some stipulations to this though. So the first one, this is filtered for athletes over three Watts per kilogram. So we're trying to weed out the outliers that you get with like brand new athletes, right? Additionally, this is over the course of the open beta. So this doesn't include much of the training season where athletes typically see improvements, right? Uh, in fact, if anything, athletes tend to see the decreasing FTP when they go through the summer and into the fall. So yeah. that's something that's that once again, lots of confidence that we're getting from this number that in the quote off season, in terms of improvements that athletes get, we're still seeing a 20% increase in likelihood that they're going to see an increase in their watt kg. That's, that's what all of us athletes are going for power to weight increase. And, right. And there could be a sample bias too, of these are the people that are maybe the most dedicated or something like that. But I think mm -hmm. you guys made sure like people were training all that sort of stuff. Like, uh, yeah. but anyways, it's just, yeah. It is a, it's, it is a, not a published metric that we're going to like put in a paper, but also for us, it shows, I think combined with all the other metrics we have, and then the feedback from people in the forum and, uh, private and support that it's a really good product and it's a huge improvement. Uh, I think, I think it's, this will be expected mm -hmm. in training software for the future. Now, this sort of thing. Uh, yep, yeah. absolutely. And it's worth saying too, is that. Uh, this is by far not even remotely close to what we think is, I, I'm not even sure a finished product actually exists with adaptive training, right? It will constantly improve and we're constantly improving it. So to see this just in the beta period, to already see these positive signs is super encouraging. And now we have so much more that we're constantly working on to improve it. So then we can drive those numbers even higher. I can say as CEO, this is the adaptive training is the future. And this is what we are betting our, our wagon on and to, to put our effort into improve this. Uh, it's like, if we're building a high rise, we have a, if we've been building the foundation super deep. And now we have two stories of this skyscraper that we're trying to build and we have the foundation and we just want to keep now building on it and get that huge hundred story, 200, I don't know, 200 stories, thing, big, huge Dubai, uh, yeah. building. Burj Khalifa. Uh, <laughs> yep. This yeah. isn't something like now we're moving to the next thing. Uh, this is, this is the future. And as we get more data and more athletes, the system we believe will constantly improve and we want to get better and better and better at it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, do you want to get into some of the questions that we have from athletes or do you want to jump into the rest of the stuff that we have listed out here, Nate? What do you want? I'm here for you. Okay, cool. I will do everything. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, there's a, let's just actually look at like the basics of, if you ask the question of how does it make you faster? It's kind of like six main ways. And Nate's mentioned a lot of them already, but the first one is that it customizes your training to your abilities and your needs and your goals. So that means that if you have a training plan, adaptive training is going to look at where your point B is right. Getting from point A to point B, and it's constantly going to adjust your training so that you're taking your own pace to get to wherever your goal is. Uh, it also looks at, like Nate said, missed workouts uh, or unique abilities. If you're really good at VO2 or not good at threshold, it adjusts for all that. 
So that's one, th those are a few ways that it makes you faster. Then number two, the main, one of the most profound ones is when life gets in the way and you miss those workouts, you have to take time off, whether it's proactive or reactive, you suddenly just missed a bunch of workouts or you're planning vacation, adaptive training works around that. It also works really well with FTP testing. So like what Nate said before, <clears throat> You can do a ramp test. You can get a great measure of your FTP, but that still might not mean that you can just nail VO2 intervals right off the bat that are super hard or nail those super long uh, sweet spot work, whatever it may be. You are a unique athlete and you have a unique profile. So as a result, you need to be trained uniquely. And that's what adaptive training does. It allows each of those energy systems to be trained independently uh, while working with your FTP to make sure it's all anchored well. Uh, the other thing that it does too, is it makes it easier to change, or I guess to kind of like, a, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but it makes it easy for you to be able to make adjustments on the fly, but still keep everything on track. There's some days when I can't do the 90 minute workout that was scheduled. And I honestly only have time for 30 minutes. So instead of doing nothing, uh, adaptive training has this cool thing called alternates that allows us to be able to, when you look at the scheduled workout, you can just click on that and you can say, I only have 30 minutes today. And it will suggest workouts that are similar in terms of intent that fit the constraints that my life puts upon me. It's super cool. Uh, you can go for longer too. If you have more time to fill up, you can change up the type of workouts, whatever else, but it tries to give you, or it gives you those suggestions to try to keep you on track and not let you derail too much. Okay. So workout alternates, we just talked about right now, the, the part it. that I've used, I've had life stress and I don't know if you've ever had, this is my experience. You have a workout and it's planned and you're ready for it. And then something happens during that day or the night before, maybe it's a kid crying, you can't sleep. Uh, maybe you didn't eat well, or you had work stress or something like that. And then you get intimidated by that workout, right? And you're like, <laughs> Ugh, I do not want to do this workout. Uh, sometimes you, you can do it and you get into one interval and it's like, it's fine. But what I've done is there's this way where you can look at it. And let's say it's a threshold level five, which is air quotes productive, which we'll talk about. Uh, and what you can do is you can use workout alternatives and just get a slightly easier workout. So instead of a five, you can do a, a level four and of the same kind of like profile. So meaning if it's over unders, you can do instead of a five, it does a four. And that would probably mean you either get more rest or probably shorter intervals. And the difference between that one point, especially when you're stressed can be night and day and you can get through the workout. You still progress. You still put like money in the bank. Um, and it's so much better than doing the harder workout and then only, you know, getting through one interval, uh, stopping it and you feel bad about yourself or you shouldn't feel bad about yourself, but you can, I've fallen that trap before too. It's so much better just to do a slightly easier workout. Um, sometimes you'll take the day off, but it is, it's such a good, cool feature and it makes it so easy to be able to just do an easier workout that day. And sometimes this happens for weeks. You might have weeks where you can't progress. And you just kind of like maintain. And that also is good. And it gives you mental energy and space. And uh, it's okay not to like bang it out every time and try to just constantly get faster and faster and faster. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a, it's such a helpful feature, something over nothing, right? And it makes mm -hmm. that possible. We talk about that on the podcast all the time. Uh, the other way is, uh, so let's say that you're not following like a training plan for a specific event and you're very hyper-driven toward that event. If you just want to train and do some base training for a while and you toss on a base training plan, it will still adapt within that. It'll adapt that plan and it will just make sure that it's always trying to give you the best base fitness you can get or build or specialty, whatever plan you just toss on, that's fine. If you don't follow a plan and you don't want to, then you get trained now from this. And that's a huge benefit and a really, really popular tool that we're seeing a lot of athletes use. Even those hyper-driven athletes, when they're in between plans or they have some time frame that they want to be able to fill or change up their training, Train Now is really good for it too. Um, do you want to explain Train Now really quick, Nate? Because it's a part of adaptive training. Yeah, Train Now. The reason why we built it is um, a lot of people don't want to be on a training plan, and they don't want the commitment of a training plan. Their life isn't set up in a way where, or they don't have the motivation or the desire. I think the desire is the right way to say it. That they want to say, hey, Tuesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever days you pick on a plan, I want to work out. And what Train Now does is it's almost like uh, it just, you open the app and it shows you three workouts an endurance, a climbing, or an attacking workout that are right for your level. 
it's defaulted, I think, to 60 minutes, but you can change it for 30 minutes or 45 or hour and a half, whatever you want. And it just shows you what is appropriate for you. And it looks at what your levels are, what your current fitness is, and what workouts you've done recently. It gives you three suggestions. You can hit shuffle and see something again. But the idea is I can open the app. I can look at it. Oh, this looks interesting and fun. I'm going to do this workout and just go. There's no mental energy. There's no stress. There's who cares if you miss days, whatever you want to do. You can just jump in and go. And that is a, I actually did that over the summer. I use train now because I didn't have, I had a divorce and I was like, I don't feel like doing a structured training plan right now. I really want to train when I feel like it because my emotions are changing all the time. And I didn't want to put myself in a situation where uh, you feel bad for missing a workout, which no one should. Like, I want to say that, but it, it is something that just to be aware of. So I was aware of it. I didn't do a training plan. I use train now. And it is, it's really fun. Actually, it's almost like a little off season because uh, you just get to train how you feel and you can still get faster. And I did get faster, which is, is really cool. It's like a very effective way to train. Um, I think for some people, actually, if the stress of a training plan or not the stress, the, uh, the, I don't know what the right word is, John, but there is a, a training plan has to have me, um, I feel like a training plan, even with adaptive training, I have to follow it a certain way. And that sure. could be, have some kind of impact mentally on me. If that's that the level way, of commitment, right? Yeah, that, exactly. That, 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 might that might not be necessary for everybody and it could even be damaging for some people to add on that sort of pressure yeah for sure you could just use train now and feel better and actually get faster have less stress and just open it up and see how you want to train when you want to train and mm -hmm. uh yeah be a be a lot lot faster you might not win a national championship but if you're trying to finish some race or improve your category like and this makes you more consistent hundred percent. You're going to be faster, right? For sure. Reduce stress, make you more consistent. It's, it's going to be awesome. And one of the big things that it fixes, uh, all of us are not very good at estimating what we can and can't do, uh, whether it's recency bias or whether it's whatever it might be, we just drop into the workout and then you'd say, Oh, I want to do that workout today. And you do that workout. And then it ends up being super easy and you don't feel like you got the benefit or really hard and it completely blows you up. And this is what train now really fixes is it allows you to just jump in, pick what you want to do, but it, it guides that suggestion so that it's appropriate for you. So in that way, when you just drop in, you're not getting blown up. It always feels like the right workout at the right time. It's a, yep. it's a huge help. And the other side of this, let's say that you don't follow a training plan. Like you aren't using plan builder to follow something really specific. You haven't put a training plan on your calendar just to train generally, and you aren't doing train now everyone still benefits from, from adaptive training in a different way. And that now everything is, um, quantified in a totally different way. Every time you look at a workout, Nate was mentioning earlier, like a level four versus a level five. And that gets into something that we have called workout levels. So we've used our machine learning to be able to analyze all of the workouts in our library. And if you've used trainer road, you've probably noticed a huge amount of new workouts have come up. And that's because of this, because what we did is we looked at this and we said, analyze all of these workouts to find out how hard this workout is in relation to another workout that's perhaps similar, but actually different. So our system looks at what energy system it works, but then also how it works that energy system. Is it over unders? Is it just hard start intervals? Is it sustained intervals? Is it short ones? If it's VO two max, is it on offs or is it bursts? Or if, is it that reduced amplitude bill at profile? It looks at that and cuts these workouts down into all these very, very fine tuned categories. And then it's able to say this workout is harder than this workout by this precise amount. And when it does that, that allows our system to be able to make the right recommendation for whatever workout you have next. But it also allows you as an athlete to look at workouts and understand, oh, okay, that one is harder than that one, or that one is easier than that one. And it's cool because we actually just had an athlete on, uh, he just tagged us on Instagram and he had taken some time off and adaptive training is super smart. And it has something built into it called energy system decay. So when you take time off, it knows depending on how much time you've taken off, how much reduction you should expect in your aerobic capabilities in the endurance zone or in the threshold zone, whatever it might be. And it gave him a workout and he was like, there's no way I can do that workout. That's crazy. And Nate and I have had that same experience so many times where we've gotten it suggested to us and we're like, oh, that's, you know, that that's way too easy. And it ends up being perfect or that's way too hard. And it ends up being perfect. 
um, he ended up absolutely nailing the workout. And he was like, that's incredible. Like I never would have thought that I could have done that workout just coming back from time off, but because it has this really measured way of doing it, it makes it so that you get the right workout at the right time. So that's another way everyone, when they look at workouts, you can see the levels. I think too, we could say, uh, sometimes it's a training zone rather than energy system. Cause some mm -hmm. training zones have the same energy system. And I, I think I'm guilty of this too, where I use those words interchangeably, but before yeah. the, uh, physiology police, uh, message us <laughs> in the forum, uh, we're sorry for, if we do that, but just the understanding that, uh, performance in sweet spot and threshold is different for athletes. Um, even if the energy systems are extremely close that are being worked in those, they are mm -hmm. different workout zones and that's what we're concentrating are those zones. Yep, for sure. So I want to recap the simplicity of using it. All you do, do your workouts, fill out your surveys, you'll get adaptations. And then after that, you'll see your abilities improve and it'll, you'll, your consistency is going to go up. It's exciting. Um, right now it's automatically active for everybody on trainer road. Uh, everyone will get it. If you sign up right now, if you're an existing trainer road athlete, if you have your account, uh, if you, if you've suspended your account temporarily, when you come back, uh, it'll be ready and waiting for you. Uh, so then you can start using it. Uh, everybody has access to it. You can access, and you'll be able to see all this stuff, just how you use the app naturally. Like I said, in that process of doing your workouts, filling out your surveys and just repeating and going through that whole process. It's exciting. Um, uh, if you have training plans on your calendar right now, if they're really old training plans, like, uh, in the past year, we've updated all of our plans across the board. So if you have, I can't think of a situation where somebody would likely still have a training plan that was not one of the new ones, but if you do, then you'll have to update that plan to start using uh, adaptive training because it doesn't adapt to the old plans. Uh, it does with the new ones, but that's basically the only spot where I would think that anybody wouldn't be able to use it is that edge case. Otherwise everybody's on board. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of where we sit with that. Um, we already explained, explained workout levels, which is a data-driven ML analysis of how hard a workout is compared to another workout. Uh, but we should probably talk about progression levels. Nate, you mentioned them briefly, briefly earlier, but, uh, what are progression levels? Yeah. Progression levels. Uh, this is the achievable and productive that you want to me to talk about, right. Or mm -hmm. the actual levels. So this is the levels that you see on your career when you log in, yes, you okay. see on your career. Like, so we've broken it out. I'll see if I can do this off the top of my head. The concussion, yeah. I can still feel, but it is, <laughs> we've broken out your, your, uh, workout, uh, levels into zones. So we have endurance, tempo, sweet spot, threshold, VO2 max, anaerobic and sprint. Okay. So we have those and it's almost like you're a, for those, um, gamers out there, you're in like an RPG and you, you have, those can be levels between one and 10. And this is relative to your FTP. And after you do a fitness assessment or fitness assessment, or you change your FTP, we set you some default levels. And this is based on where you're at before your history and a, and a bunch of other things. And then as you work out and let's say you're a level four threshold and you accomplish a level 4.5 threshold workout, your new threshold workout level is 4.5. And what this does is it gives you a very clear understanding of how well you're performing at that FTP. Because the, the problem was before is that um, I would have my FTP set to, let's say 320 and it might be set there for a while, but inside of that system or inside of when it was there for that, those maybe eight weeks, my ability to express that FTP and how fast I was changed dramatically, but I didn't have a way to actually understand how fast I am inside of this. Uh, and especially like season over season and stuff like this. So by having this, if you start at a level two threshold and you work up to a level 10, you are such a different athlete but your FTP hasn't changed. And this also gives you small wins in training all the time. It can be really um, confusing with, hey, this over-unders, I do eight minutes over-unders and it has four minutes of rest. But this next one is nine minutes over-unders with five minutes of rest. Which one's harder? You don't really know. It's really hard to figure out with your brain uh, as a human to figure out which one is harder. And you might even not understand that one is harder than the other. Uh, but with this system, with the levels, you can always, you can make sure that you are progressing. And if you have problems progressing in the future, um, you can look at your life and be like, Hmm, am I, my genetic potential? Probably not. Uh, am I eating right? Am I sleeping right? How's my stress? Uh, how much am I giving into this workout? Uh, all of these sorts of things that we've talked about for years in order to really have fine grain understanding of how fit you are. Yep. 
or like your video game character levels, like Nate said, uh, like, you know, a car might have really good handling, top speed cornering, and they have those different bar charts that represent that. It's just like that. You have your zones and you have your abilities and it's a representation of what you can do at, at that given snapshot in time. Uh, uh, once you take an FTP test, they change and they change dynamically to you as an individual based on what you got. That's actually one of the questions that we've got a person asked, why did I get all ones after I did my FTP test? My levels were somewhere over here. I took my FTP test. Now I'm all down to ones. And the best way to answer that one is the bigger the change in your levels, likely the bigger the increase or bigger change in FTP, right? So if you just absolutely smashed it and you nailed and you increased 50 watts or something like that on your FTP, then chances are in that case, you're going to get your levels dropping down quite a lot. And that makes sense, right? Because if you were able to do a level five before, and then you got a huge FTP increase, you wouldn't want to just jump into level fives right after that. You'd want to be dropped back. So then you're getting the right threshold workout that you need at that new level. Yeah, it's more so progressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you, for sure, you, you shouldn't ever be at the same level as you were before. And think of it, it's the same with video games. Uh, if you level up your character, you're like little bars start over and you got to fill them up again with experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, so think of it as an opportunity. And it's kind of fun too to switch from like a level eight threshold to a level one because the workouts change a lot. And it's yeah. like a different experience and you can kind of build into your new threshold. And with adaptive training with the surveys, if for some reason you do need a faster progression, with answering, you're maybe your level one, you're like, that was not very hard. Well, adapt training will look at that and then increase you quickly. Uh, and having, you know, a couple easy workouts and a training plan is so much better than just getting smashed and trying to like <laughs> flog your way through, through it where it's too hard. For sure. The last thing to define is difficulty levels. So we've had workout levels. That's how, that's the ranking of the workouts. We've had progression levels, which is kind of like your individual ranking of your abilities. Now, difficulty levels, and what those are is what Nate was talking about before when we talk about something that's achievable, productive, stretch, breakthrough, or not recommended. So each workout will have a label on it now, and you'll see that label. Um, That is just an additional layer of help for you to be able to understand how achievable a workout should be. Uh, It makes, you know, we all look at two by 20 at threshold, and we wish that we could be able to do that. And that might be achievable for Nate, but for me, it might be a breakthrough or not recommended workout right now. So it really helps me understand, oh, okay, that's why I'm stepping my way into this. That's what I'm getting. And it also makes it so that when you're um, making adjustments with um, alternates or you're just trying to pick a workout, you're trying to see where it's at, it gives you a good way to be able to set your expectations so that, okay, today's an achievable workout. So it should feel like this. Whereas today is a breakthrough workout. If you end up picking one of those, it should feel really hard. So it's a really good, um, it's, it's a good way to be able to get additional context into those workouts. How, how it works in the system is achievable is anything at the same level or le- lower, but then productive breakthrough, or I'm sorry, productive stretch breakthrough or not recommended are progressively more like higher, a bigger jump in your current level. And what we found, and everyone's probably experienced this is that if you make a huge try to jump in your training, it can be, maybe you can get through it. Maybe it is a stretch or it's really, really hard, but it's also, you're more likely to be able to have a, uh, to have failures inside of that. And what we saw is a lot of people, they might look at the intensity factor, um, which intensity factor, so tricky. it's a metric used for TSS <laughs> or the TSS, the TSS of a workout might be exactly the same, but it, it could be so much harder. For example, in the same time period, four by 10 minutes at threshold, is the same TSS and intensity factor is for 40 minutes straight at threshold. Yeah. And you can one by uh, 40. Yeah. One by 40. So there, there might be off by like one or two TSS inside of that, depending on how the workout and the warm is built, but it, we all know that's a huge difference in workout, but if you're <laughs> picking based on TSS and IF, you might be like, I should be able to do this. And then you try it and you're like, you're not ready yet for it. And AT will do is you do 10 minutes and you do 12 and you do 15, and you do 20. Right. And then you do a 30, like broken up and you work your way up to 40. And then suddenly you're doing 40 minutes at 300 Watts. And like, I never expect to be able to do this Um, just because you've been stepped slowly through this system rather than doing these big, huge jumps. Mm. I want to take some time to address the concern of like, will adaptive training just (laughs) kind of take me off course with my training plan. So in, in other words, like, will it keep adapting and just adapt further away from the true North that it was supposed to be on? Uh, there are various different questions that we got from people asking that. 
And to do that, I want to discuss a little bit about how the training plans are built and how adaptive training works together. So each day has a very specific intent and something that should be accomplished and it's defined. And it basically, uh, when we build the plans, we put up guardrails on those days for adaptive training to work within. It has these constraints that allows it to know, okay, I can select workouts within this range and this range, depending on the, what this athlete needs. Uh, that day should be a day where we're really trying to drive the needle and improve performance, or this is a day where we should not be trying to improve performance and we need to favor recovery, or this is an off day. So absolutely we're not scheduling something on this day. So the plans are the plans and adaptive training. They work together really intelligently. Each day has a specific goal to accomplish within that plan and adaptive training will always work within that framework. So that combined with your objective data of your performance and the subjective data of your feedback that you give in those surveys, always make sure that it's recalibrating and it makes sure that it's staying on course for you and, and training you as an individual. So like what that really means is that you're not going to get a workout that because you um, have an event coming up and it's in one week, but you failed one workout. It doesn't mean that it's going to do some huge step change and make you do one hour at threshold right before that. If you failed last week at doing 15 minutes at threshold, right? It's going to look at what you need as an athlete, look at the guardrails and adjust. That also means that it's not going to give you a two hour workout on a day when you should be only having 30 minute workouts, right? Um, and vice versa as well. So it's all defined and constrained within all of that. Um, it's probably also, this is a good opportunity to bring up uh, one of the criticisms that I saw uh, was somebody said that it feels like adaptive training just makes my workouts easier. Um, and some people say the opposite. They're like, it seems like it makes my workouts harder, but it's super important to remember something that every day should not bring you to the ground. I know that a lot of us are type, you know, type a athletes that really want to feel like today, because I went completely deep went all out, like Nate was saying, and I had absolutely nothing left that was productive, but that's not the case. We need to break that association. Productive changes, depending on whatever goal you need to accomplish for that day and a well-structured plan, make sure that you're doing that sort of variation in terms of what you need to do on those days. So some days it will feel easier. Some days it will feel harder, but it's the right workout you should get. Um, yeah, that's, there's some, I, my response yeah. to that is yes. Like it just makes <laughs> it easier. Yes. Because, um, whatever is going on and how you're answering the surveys and performing uh, it, whatever the default, like and we have just the, like the bell curve middle default, it was not set up correctly for you. So it's, it's a positive. It's like, wow, this AT adaptive training found that this is not for me and it's adjusting it either way. Those are like, I, I feel like those should be the people that cheer the most. Right. If yep. you go through a system, if you go through the training plan and you never get a single adaptation and you never miss a workout and you move forward, like you've hit the bell. There could be people like this, right? You go through a whole year. You're yeah. exactly in the middle of the bell curve. There's no difference. Uh, you're like the standard uh, physiological specimen. Nothing never changes. You never have a break. Those are the people should be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> it's yeah. not doing anything. If it's yeah. changing a lot, it's there for a reason and it's a good reason. Uh, and you should, I would, I would be like celebrating that rather than complaining about it. A hundred percent. Just because we're used to training and running ourselves into the ground as these type A crazy driven athletes doesn't mean that it's the right thing for us to do. Um, there's some data behind this too, that I want to share. So uh, there's been a 94% increase in productive workouts completed since we've launched adaptive training. That's huge. Nearly doubled. Like the, that's then where you want athletes is in that productive range, right? Some days you also want them to be doing achievable ones. And some days you want them stretch, but predominantly you're going to be in that productive range. And let me say it again. Productive means like a stepped increase in that level. So you're not doing these big jumps. You're not going down, but you're just doing that progressive stepped increase, which is, uh, it's like, uh, overload over time with proper yep. rest. That's what we want to see. It's every coach's dream. They want to dwell within that productive range, right? Uh, yep. You don't burn that's out. How you get improvement. You don't get smashed, but you're also challenging yourself and you're like measurably doing more work on these workouts. Yep. That's a fact. Yes. There was a 5% decrease in achievable workouts completed. So in that case, it's probably talking about the workouts. Uh, sometimes when you pick a workout, uh, that's just too easy and not really driving the needle. Um, but then again, 5%, that's not much of a movement and that's what Pretty we want to see, right? Like yeah. that's where we want it. There's a 53% decrease in stretch workouts completed. 
So a stretch, I believe that's a jump of greater than 1.5, maybe? Yeah, uh, I think it's greater than one. Greater than it's one. like one to two, yeah. Yep. So in some cases you are prescribed stretch workouts uh, because that's what the plan has in place, right? Um, and in some cases you are not prescribed them. But it's good to see that 53% decrease because when I just self-select workouts, I select stretch and breakthrough. I don't know about you, Nate, but like that's what I always see because I think, okay, I just need to do the next big thing, next big thing. And it always yeah. ends up driving me down. Before levels, that's what I would do because you're like, I want to get to this end result. Let me back it out. And this is, I just have to do, it's like, Pete, <laughs> I just got to stick it at 400. And that's the way I, I, uh, <laughs> I'll get through this thing, uh, which is not the right way to train. It's like yeah. trying to figure out, I need to hit this FTP or this kind of wattage for this minutes. So I'll just fill everything else in. So I'll automatically get there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's not the way. For sure. There's a 77% decrease in breakthrough workouts. So those, I think that we're talking a two, a greater than two jump. Yeah. And it's the idea too, because the, the actual numbers might change in the future as we get more data and they might actually be used. That's if it is beneficial, we'll have these specific for uh, specific people or specific mm -hmm. like uh, demographics. But the idea is, yeah, it's more than a stretch by a lot. Yep. And this is a yep. big jump in your level. And then a 93% decrease in not recommended workouts completed, which hallelujah, that's good to see. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is a, uh, something that we've had people be vocal about on the internet is they'll say, you know, a trainer was too hard. And I look at their career and they jump from something that's very, maybe they do 10 minutes at threshold and then they jump to an hour or they do this really hard anaerobic one. And they're like, trainer road is too hard for me. It wasn't in your plan. You just chose that workout and uh, this is what level's trying to do. So if you bring that workout up, it says, this is not recommended for you. Like, I almost mm -hmm. think we should have a, like a, they should sign something, like, send them a DocuSign. <laughs> yeah. Like I will not hold trainer road responsible for this workout, but honestly too, we should have gave people more feedback, right? Uh, we can't mm -hmm. expect people to understand this stuff without this system in place. So by doing this, um, if you do do a stretch workout and you don't nail it, that's okay. Like that is expensive. That, that's expected. If you can't hit a productive workout, well, look at your, look at your life, right? What's going on? Like I talked about before, um, all of these things give you more information in order to do the side. There's always going to be a side of like personal responsibility of, um, mm. looking at my life, looking at my stress, looking at my nutrition, my motivation, uh, inside of this workout. And then that works inside in tandem with adaptive training so that you can, uh, if you do not feel well, you can, you know, kick it back. Or if you feel awesome, Hey, I'm going to actually use workout alternatives and do a stretch today. These workouts haven't been hard, hard enough. I don't like how adaptive training has been pushing me forward. Perfectly reasonable. But if it does happen and you don't complete it, please don't flame us on the internet for, yeah. for, uh, doing that. Cause we did not prescribe that to you. Oh, and, and a popular complaint too, is that trainer roads plans are too hard. And this whole entire system now makes it so that that, that at complaint is, I mean, it's an impossibility, right. In the sense that we have every day is planned and intentional and in how it progresses uh, with such high resolution of workouts to select from so that it's adjusting for you. It's not trying to adjust you to the plan, right? Uh, that's, that's the key. So that's a good way difference. to put it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's go into, um, yeah, we already covered surveys, so we're good there. And we're going to get into a lot of the live questions that y'all are submitting, which thank you, by the way, to everybody joining us live and, and asking those. And thanks to Sean and Jesse and everybody else that's in the live chat and helping answer a lot of those. We'll vocalize them for podcast listeners so then they can uh, hear them as well. But uh, this is a big question is, do I still need to take a ramp test, uh, right, mm -hmm. Nate, with, since I have these levels? And then the other question is, well, then down the road, are we even going to need testing? Yes, that is a great, great question. Um, I don't think... There's like four psychopaths who like taking tests. Everyone else <laughs> does not. Just kidding. Sorry, everyone. Some people are like, oh, feel attacked. Uh, yeah. No, doing a ramp test, uh, if you really know you're faster, doing a ramp test can feel really super good to get that very concrete feedback that, yes, I got faster. Mm -hmm. What uh, the current recommendation for training road is when you first sign up, yes, do a ramp test. That is because we have no idea what your fitness is. We can look at outside workouts and we have a system in place where we kind of estimate it. But inside can be different uh, with motivation and cooling and your flywheel and a bunch of other things we've talked about. Yes, do that RAM test. But after that, we don't have this built in the system, but I'm going to give a very special insight to all the podcast listeners. Ooh. <laughs> it, is, it is okay as you go through, if you're training consistently, you're not taking these big breaks, is you can 
skip the ramp test and keep getting your levels up. And once you get closer to like a eight, nine or 10, you can uh, manually adjust your FTP to what you think it is. And our levels will adjust so that it's still progressive in your system and you can keep training. Now, will this be as accurate as ramp testing? No, it won't be. But if you hate testing, this is a perfectly valid way to train. And as you have to update your FTP, if you didn't nail it right, um, adaptive training is going to look at it and uh, adjust your workouts pretty quickly, right? There might be a week or week and a half of like kind of adjustment as it kind of centers in on your fitness. But after that, you can move forward and be awesome. This is something too that we will build in the product. So it's automatic for those who don't want to take RAM tests, but you might not want to take a RAM test every four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks. Um, and that's perfectly fine. And I did this myself, but as you go through the levels, bring them all the way up is also fun. It just looks mm -hmm. cool to see that go up and then you get to start over and do it again. Uh, so it, it, yeah, it, it's okay. I'm telling y'all it's okay yeah. not to take the RAM test and, uh, or any of the other tests and just adjust it. The other thing is just don't do huge jumps in your FTP. Right. Like if you are 200, don't be like, Oh, I'm now 235 uh, because I'm feeling awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't, that's when you take it. That's when you take a ramp test, right? For sure. Yes. Like that's when you need yep. that sort of calibration. Or if you take a lot of time off, if you take many weeks off or, uh, some, you know, you had an injury, you broke your leg and you come back, like it's not going to be close. You're probably not going to be able to understand what your FTP is. And we're not going to be able to understand it either because there's a big change inside of your life. So take that ramp test to get you calibrated again. And then as, again, as long as you're consistent and a week off is fine. Um, but I'm thinking like you take two months off, do a ramp test after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then testing in the future. What do you think, Nate? I mean, the, every workout is a test, right? So the, what I want to get to is it, it, there's some visions on that first thing that we won't talk about for ramp tests, but after that, I would love to get to the point where nobody has to test again. And just based on how you feel in all the workouts, that is like a combination of what your FTP is. And we can then keep adjusting that and uh, give you an information of how fast you are and make you progressive without having you to do ramp tests in between. That is mm -hmm. the, that's the vision, the goal and still letting people do ramp tests. But I think, I think everyone would rather just have a workout that day than have a ramp. Not everyone, most people would sure. uh, inside that system. So that is definitely what we as a company want to get to. For sure. Megan has a live question that uh, kind of falls into what we're talking about here. She says, as users, as users have more data, we call them athletes, not users. Um, as athletes have more data with adaptive training, will the system learn how much to adjust your levels by following a new FTP test? Yes. It's actually changed multiple times inside of this beta. Uh, there have been so many tweaks based on data and we could do a better it's, this is what we uh, struggle with as or I struggle with as a leader is how much of the, like the secret sauce do we share with marketing and how much do we like not share because our competitors look at our stuff and mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could do it. I don't know. We could talk about it as a marketing team, but it's very, you got to make sure you don't give away the, the recipe for Coke, but you also want to <laughs> say this is a secret or this is a special recipe. Uh, and I want to tell everyone too, because it's very exciting, but yeah, what we've done is, um, We've looked at how people perform on workouts, um, the steps that they have. Uh, we break it down uh, by demographics to look at that data too. And we have then adjusted things inside of adaptive training to keep improving. Yep. Yeah, there's been lots of improvements over the beta period, lots of tweaks and adjustments that we've had to do that we've learned, whether it's adjusting um, how specific things are analyzed, how specific energy systems compare to another and how the workouts rank within that, how it all works with plan builder. You know, we've mm -hmm. constantly had teams of people working on those adjustments. So they'll continue for sure. This is a cool one, John, is as you do a workout like sweet spot, or let's say you do a, a level eight threshold workout and you're only at level one sweet spot. Well, you can probably do way more than level one at sweet spot, right? You're only at level one because you haven't we, we haven't, we don't have any data of you actually working in that workout zone. Uh, mm -hmm. But so what we've done though, is we've looked at how people can, if they do that level of uh, threshold, how then are subsequent workouts in sweet spot and how do they perform with the surveys and all that sort of stuff. And what we can do then 
is you get credit for different energy systems as you go through them based on like one anchor one. So with threshold, you get credit inside for a sweet spot. And what's interesting is some of them have relations where you get credit and other ones we can't, there's no correlation in our yeah. uh, data set where you might think like, like for instance, anaerobic to threshold, I, unless something's changed recently, which it always could. So I'll put that caveat out. Uh, if you do a level 10 anaerobic workout that has, doesn't have influence on your threshold level, which is super interesting, right? Uh, especially we're, we're getting, you know, many, 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 many workouts to be able to validate this data, especially over time, millions and millions and millions of workouts. Uh, that, that is pretty, I think, super interesting. And as this system goes forward, like I said, this is the foundation. We want to add more inputs and make everything more custom and just keep doing that for, uh, there's to the end of time. There, there's yeah. no time where we're like, this is done. Uh, the only time would be as if we have so many ML systems where it constantly improves and there's no new ML systems to build, but I don't think that's going to happen because tools will get better. We'll have new inputs in and we'll just keep iterating and trying to get it better and better and better. Yeah. That probably gets to a question that I've seen too, where people are asking, uh, are you using heart rate data for this or HRV or sleep trackers, that sort of stuff to be able to fill, uh, bring in that data. And like Nate said, in the future, we'd love to be able to bring in anything that we can that's reliable data that actually helps improve people's training, right? Like, so that's, it's on our radar for sure. Right now we're just using power, um, your performance. And so your objective performance data, your subjective survey data to be able to drive these improvements. And that subjective data captures what so many of those other devices um, are working to try to capture, right? In terms of how you feel, but so yeah, down the road. We use heart rate too for some things that are not specifically integrated right now that are being built um, that we have in our own personal beta. But yeah, it, as John said, as long as it, the cool part about it is that we can understand if it does have an impact. Mm -hmm. So since we have such a big data set and everything so finely grain tuned is that if we bring something in, you, what you can do is you can use ML or you can use other statistical, statistical met methods to figure out is does this have is there a correlation between what this thing says in your performance? And we have a really good way to measure performance. And then we can see, does it have an input or not? And there, as far as I know, there's no one else who has the data set and the granularity that we have, and especially with a subjective measure, measurement, because that is the key piece that I think has been lost at scale is mm -hmm. to understand that subjective part. So you can bring that data in and you can understand, hey, there is a correlation with this or not. And then we can decide as a company is, should this be used for everybody um, or not? Or maybe it's only certain people, maybe it's a certain demographic that, that needs uh, this kind of data. We're not sure, but that's the, that's the evolution. But for adaptive training, we had to make sure that this system worked really well before we start building and bringing more systems. And that's where the point, this system works really well now, at least to everybody. We'll look at bugs and then boom, next step. We, um, I'm not sure what the team has decided what the next step is, but then we'll talk about that and keep getting it better and better and better. For sure. Uh, and the question here, and then we're going to get into more of the live ones that you've submitted, but uh, basically, do I need a power meter to use adaptive training? Um, power data, we, like Nate said, we've been building the system to be concrete and reliable so that we can kind of use it as like a ruler to be able to compare all other things. And that's what power meter or power data is so great at. It's very objective. So you need power data, um, whether that comes from virtual power or smart trainer, power meter, whatever it is, uh, to be able to do that. There is kind of a way that you can use it without power data as well. So right now, if you do it uh, with trainer road, you can do your workouts inside on the trainer with the trainer road app or outside with your Garmin or Wahoo head unit, right? And in those cases, when you do the workouts outside, if you don't have a power meter, there's that little switch where you can say, instead of power-based outside workouts, I just want RPE based since I don't have a power meter. And in that case, what adaptive training will do is it'll assume that you completed your workout when you upload that ride, once it's done, uh, you can go back in and change that and say, I didn't complete this workout. And you can go through the survey flow that Nate talks about earlier, but it'll assume that you completed them. So it'll move you along in your training. You're not getting the benefit of the ML analysis, but you still are getting adaptations. So it's, it's, it's absolutely still adapting, but it's just not at the same level of what you get with the ML analysis to be able to drive more specific changes thereafter. Um, so that's a, a kind of a, a cool way to do it. And that actually kind of leads into the multi-sport talk, um, and outside rides and all this stuff. So 
one thing that as of now, which we're talking November 2nd, 2021, uh, that adaptive training does not have is the ability to analyze unstructured rides. So your races outside the group rides you do the just easy rides, whatever else, um, the current iteration of adaptive training is not analyzing those that said, that's absolutely something we've been working on and seeing huge progress on with uh, a fantastic team of engineers that have been working on that one. Uh, Nate, do you have anything else that you would want to add yeah. onto that point? That is the number one question on Instagram that I get from people. I want to yeah. say, I think I asked what questions you had and 90% were asking for that. Like, when does that come out? Um, I mean, it, we're doing something that no one's ever done in the world. And that is, it's like, uh, that is why it's difficult. And I can't give an example. It's not like we're building a credit card for them where, Hey, we know it's going to take this long. We can project manage it out. Um, that being said, we, we have an internal alpha that does analyze our outside workouts and we are tweaking it now. So that's the state mm -hmm. that we're at. It's not like, Oh, we have this pie in the sky. It's going to be like, it's on the roadmap. It is, we are testing it internally. And then what we'll do is we'll test it externally. We will release it to other groups and then we'll do it. This is, uh, we understand as a company, we need to have a complete vision of all of your workouts. Uh, as of now, until that gets done, I would ask users or athletes, if you do a four hour hard ride on a Monday and you have VO2 max the next day, please switch to an achievable or skip that day <laughs> or do a recovery ride. Like have that under basic understanding and I think everyone who listens to the podcast long-term has that understanding. Uh, but what we want to do is if we can look at that, we can really adjust all your levels completely. So you do any unstructured workout and then that will adjust your levels. And we'll have a the complete picture of your fitness at that fine grain control. That is, yeah. I mean, it's the ML team's number one priority is to do that. And they're doing it and they've been working on it for a very long time. Uh, yeah. It's, I don't know, it is. It's very exciting. That's yeah. that's the thing I'm most excited about for the future of Trainer Road is that specific feature launch. Uh, yeah. And I think that's why too, athletes feel it too, Jonathan, because that's why they're asking for it. And that's for why, sure. uh, yeah, right? To be able to understand more than just TSS and IF, how well they do in a workout. Yep, absolutely. Oh, that there's also, uh, I want to take that specific example that you had. If you do that big four hour ride, and then you have VO2 max the next day and that four hour ride wasn't planned or anything else in your plan. You can carry on and do that VO2 max workout. And depending on how you do, the system's going to analyze your performance, depending on how you reply in the subjective or in the surveys, it's going to figure out what to give you from there on. So it will correct, even if you don't do anything. Um, but Nate's saying a good way to make sure that you adjust things even beforehand um, instead of giving it that workout to be able to figure it out, you can just make those adjustments beforehand too. That's another way to do it. So, but it's super exciting. Uh, and the progress with the alpha that Nate's talking about too, has been really cool to see. Um, I did, I think all of my training outside, uh, not, I shouldn't say all probably about 90% of my workouts were outside this year versus 10% inside. And with all those workouts, I was like stress testing this alpha with doing a lot of different crazy things. And some days like, doing my intervals and then tacking on endurance or tacking on something else on either end. And, um, what we're really aiming for is, is for a, a truly intelligent system. That's able to comprehend, uh, the compounding effect of order of the work that you're doing as well. So, um, lots of really cool stuff that we're working on with that. And like Nate said, it's going to be huge. Um, let's talk about multi-sport because this is somewhat related to this in the sense that right now our ML is not analyzing your swims and runs, right? Um, we're using cycling to build this first and power to build this first because of, like Nate said, that objective data that we have that we can really build a concrete foundation out of. Um, and as of now, we don't have swims and runs as a high priority for the team because we have so many other fish to fry, like we're talking about with getting your outside rides, analyze everything else, but your outside or your swims and runs still adapt. They adapt in a different way than they do with your rides. Um, once again, there's no ML analysis, but if you skip that workout that you were supposed to do that swim, uh, the next time you on, uh, let's say you skip Wednesday's swim workout next Wednesday's swim workout is going to adjust based off of that. If you skip the run workout, it's going to adjust. So it's taking into account the changes or the skips or other things that would happen, like the life stress interventions that you would have, um, 
but it's not actually analyzing those. So it still adapts. Um, we're talking huge improvements from where we were, uh, even a year ago, um, for, for multi-sport athletes as well, but that's where everything sits, uh, with, with multi-sport on that side of things. And down the road too, like this is where Nate and I want, you know, when you do that race, uh, well, the whole entire company, not just Nate and I, when you do that race and you just absolutely blow every your expectations out of the water and you have that great day, that's what we want to be able to capture. Um, when you do that group ride and you were just absolutely hanging on for dear life and you thought that you could have done better, we want to be able to capture that. So then we know how to make the changes uh, down the road. So this is a huge improvement for athletes across the board. Like we mentioned the data before, and for athletes that are following the training plans inside or outside, you still get a huge amount of benefit from this and a huge increase. And this is how we step forward and really change the game entirely. Once we're able to analyze all those outside workouts too. Uh, okay. Let's get into some live questions. Uh, this first one, uh, is from, I'm not going to say your names, forgive me. I know better than to make that mistake. Um, so, uh, this first one says I'm a triathlete, but in the off season, I'm training to do a 50 K trail running race. I'd like to ride two times a week with adaptive training. How could I best le leverage adaptive training? Yeah. Train now in that situation. That is a perfect situation for training. Now on those days, you open the app, you figure out how long you feel like you want to work out for this little drop down. And what's important with this is if your priority is trail running, there are going to be days where you're like you know what? I only feel like a 30 minute or this day. I just feel like 30 minute aerobic and easier ride. And some days you want to smash it. You're like, Oh, I can do an hour or maybe you have a rest day coming up. You want to do 90 minutes. That, that is the use case for train now. Mm -hmm. And that will use that whole system of ML still gets put behind it. It is mm -hmm. not, uh, it's just, we don't have it predicted or, um, scheduled out on a calendar, which I think is that's, that's a great question. It's like, Thanks for the T-ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, Jacek says, how to do a polarized plan that will use adaptive training. Our polarized plans are designed in the context of adaptive training too, so they do adapt. Um, so, and, and to answer that one specifically, because I've followed polarized plans this year, as well as our, our, our pyramidal plans and gone through the whole process, the plans are designed to fall pretty neatly within like an 80, 20 framework in terms of days prescribed and what you're working on and also time and zone. Um, we tried to, to follow that very specific framework. So then we can collect data on that and find the best way to train people with this polarized framework, whether it's truly intent or whether it's actual time and zone, when you get adaptations, it's not going to retain that perfect time and zone it's also not going to make huge changes outside of it, right? It's not like it's going to shift you into doing something that instead of 80, 20, you're doing something like 50, 50. It's absolutely not going to do that, but you might shift 5% uh, in an extreme case, but it's much more closely going to be fractions of a percent, 1%, something like that outside of that tight 80, 20. That said, you're still going to have daily intention tied into where you need to be um, with low, medium and high volume plans. So they work well. Um, the cool part with adaptive training on this in particular with polarized plans is some people's endurance capabilities are really good. And you'll find yourself getting these endurance workouts, particularly on the weekends that tend to be longer. And when, um, so for a personal example, I had a three and a half hour one that was sitting right at like 70% or no, it was like a 65%. I did that one and I said, that was really easy. And the next week it bumped me up, uh, in terms of intensity and in terms of duration within those guardrails. So that that next week I was like, oh, that one was moderate. That's where I feel like I should be. And, and then it just continued to bring me along. So it's really cool. Um, you'll get trained. Well, also a question from the same person says also, can I adjust workout time and adaptive training? Or is it only based on selected? He says race length, I assume. So workout alternates make it so that you can adjust the time that you want to have there. And that's super easy. Um, and then if you're talking about with, uh, using plan builder to decide what sort of workouts you're doing and what sort of training you're doing for your event, that's where plan builder takes that into account. But once again, you can always use workout alternates and you can change things around and make them longer if you want. What John means is if you had a 90 minute workout, you go on the alternates, you choose 60 minutes and it will get you the same difficulty of workout. Mm -hmm. for that time period and you can move forward and that's perfectly, perfectly fine way to train. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, next one from Brian says my FTP at four Watts per kilogram, typically plateaus in the March timeframe, uh, mentioning that, uh, and then says with no real FTP gains in the build phase, can adaptive training help me break through this plateau? Yeah, for sure. This is, um, actually had someone on Instagram message me on this and this says, uh, what he said is 
hey, I, you know, I've done the ramp test and I haven't improved my ramp test result. I said, well, have you increased your threshold level at all? So no, I, don't, I haven't been doing it because I, it's, they're hard. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what you can do <laughs> is not, um, you can, you don't even have to really worry about the ramp test, but if you are, if you're like, Hey, my threshold level isn't increasing in March, you can have a plan that does threshold or build will do increased threshold and really concentrate on those threshold days and really try to nail your nutrition and your sleep the night before. And then afterwards to work for recovery and your uh, rest in between and progressively get those, uh, move those up. And if you're hitting those and those numbers are going up, you are getting faster, even if your, uh, your ramp test result doesn't change. That's another thing is we've all experienced this where it happens to the ramp test, but also happens on like a hill climb effort or something. You have like this, this way to measure your fitness, but then on that specific day, you don't perform to where, you know, you are, and this isn't a, uh, we have this at Geiger here. This isn't a, like you weren't sure, but you just know you did not do what you could. And this has happened with people. You do the ramp test, you nailed it, you executed it. And then eight weeks later, you know, you got more, you got, you got fitter, but you do it again. And for some reason you didn't have it all in that day. And what happens then is it can be demoralizing, right? Is you're like, oh, I put all this effort in and I didn't get any faster. But if you look at your levels and they steadily increased the whole time, you 100% got faster. And if you did the ramp test again, let's say your level six threshold and it doesn't change, who cares? Go to seven, eight, nine, 10 until you get to 10, then bump it up 5% and see what happens. Uh, it is, it, this takes some stress and pressure off the ramp test, because even if you don't perform better, as long as you see those levels increase, you are getting faster. This is a paradigm shift, right? In the sense yeah. that before we simply viewed our improvement through the lens of FTP and that was, that was it. it. But now with levels, you're able to actually see every single step of the way when you did a nine point or when you did a 5.7 and then the next day you did a, or next week you did a 5.9, that's an actual improvement. You've done it. You've improved. You've actually can say, Hey, it's working. And you'll notice that Brian, when you're following adaptive training in the sense that you'll probably see it's common for people to see improvements in the base phase, because what they're doing is they're really working on aerobic fitness, right? And we're talking about your aerobic threshold that we're working on. That's where you're going to see a lot of it. Now, performance is not just defined by FTP performance can be driven by so many different things. And that's what we really see in that build phase. Many times build is kind of a misnomer because people think, oh, it should build my FTP. No, build really drives the more specific fitness that you need to be able to perform at whatever discipline that you want. And this is where progression levels will really show that happening. For instance, if you're on sustained build, like maybe the win that you're looking for is to hold your current FTP for longer. And the ramp test isn't going to be able to reflect that, that I, I, you can hold your FTP for longer. It, it might, but depending on who you are, it, it might not. Um, that's a huge win though, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is the crit plan we just talked about this, your anaerobic levels could increase a ton, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have an expression of an FTP change at all with a RAM test. And although in a crit, like being super anaerobic, and if you went from three to 10, that's a, that's really huge. Like one to 10 people is huge. Very, 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 very big mm -hmm. change. Uh, if you get to a level 10, you're going to like destroy a, a punchy crit relative mm -hmm. to where you were at a one. Um, but maybe your ramp doesn't, doesn't go up at all. And you would, it can be demoralizing. You're like, oh, I put all this effort in and I didn't get any faster, but your levels went up consistently. You saw it all the time. You're good. Mm. Uh, Chuck sent in a question and Chuck, uh, you like all of us and like me initially, like all of us initially, you're overthinking this and I can't wait to help you with this one. He says, does adaptive training target the medium or hard level response, or should you be getting a sample of all perceived exertion levels? So what he's asking about is on that survey is adaptive training always trying to make your workouts hard or very hard or a specific number. And like we talked about with the training plan, how the plans are structured. Absolutely not. They are not trying to make every workout hard. That's a, that's a recipe for not improving you as an athlete. That's a recipe for burning you out. So each day is going to have different intentions and the goal is not to make it hard every day. So you should also not be looking at your survey results as kind of like a validation of where you're at. You just do your workouts, fill out the survey, and it will constantly adjust and calibrate and get adjusted right to you. So um, 
once again, don't think that your survey responses and changing one point to another or something like that is really going to drive this, uh, you know, 180 degrees and make it uh, change a lot. It's a continuum too. So mm-hmm. it's, 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 the, we understand that hard, very hard, like it means different things to different people. And it's, mm-hmm. it's not like, well, if I choose this one, the bucket, it's going to completely change. I, this is yeah. the, probably the biggest thing that I see um, athletes specifically on the forum because we're trying to reverse engineer the system who get <laughs> yeah. uh, hung up on this is what should I exactly do? And just got to relax and think yes. about just like if you climbed a hill, how hard was it going up that hill? You might be in your, your easiest gear spinning up or it might be really hard. You could, you could respond to that of how hard it was. Yep. That's exactly, yeah, great example for it. Um, Abu, he says that he's not training for any event, and he asks this question. He says, if I'm at a 10 for VO2 max and an aerobic, but at a five for threshold, should I retest or try to increase the threshold progression level? Okay, that's an interesting question. It's going to matter, okay, if you're, there's different situations. So if you are specifically doing some kind of, uh, let's say you're doing like British hill climb, where you're just doing like three minute, like mm-hmm. that's your concentrating on three minute climbs on that. I would raise my FTP and just keep hitting that VO two max, especially if you're really close to the race, that's going to be the very specific one. Other than that, if you're not in a training plan, cause I don't, if you're in a, if you're in a training plan and you've maxed out your VO two max, I would actually, your threshold's probably not going to be that low because VO two max would bring up your threshold. Uh, yeah, there was a correlation with that. If you had yeah. maxed out your VO2 max and your threshold would be a five, I actually can't think of a situation where that would be, if you're following one of our plans where that would be the case. Yeah. So it'd be tough. <laughs> you could uh, update your, basically if, if I would say, yeah, update your FTP. If you're training just for with train now and you've maxed out your VO2 max, I would then just concentrate on your VO2 or your threshold, still do some VO2 max, but I would get that up first and then, and then raise it up. I think that would just be a fun way to way to train to, to get both of those up. Yep. We had a question that says, do you have evidence that shows adaptive training users are improving their FTP more than users who are following a non-adaptive training plan? Yep. Just like we shared earlier, um, there's a 20% greater likelihood that they're going to increase their watt KG fail workouts are down. Um, absolutely. And we're going to get even more data and be sharing more data, uh, all throughout this year. We're really excited to see it through like the bulk of the training season and see how much more of a difference we can make uh, for athletes. It's also worth saying too, and and pardon me for patting ourselves on the back here, but it's like- Oh, please do. Yeah, okay, good, good, yeah. I'll compliment you specifically, Nate. Um, Thank uh, you. Because it's one thing to train one athlete and make one athlete faster. But then when you're dealing with thousands of athletes to move the needle connected or collectively forward, that's really hard. Like that's where it gets much more difficult. If you talk to coaches that have a broad profile of athletes, they might be at a net zero. They might be at a net small improvement, some sort of a drop because it's hard to train a lot of different athletes across the board. So when you actually have something like this, that shows that 20% likelihood that they're going to increase, that's a huge thing. That's a sign that you want to follow, right? Like that's a, that's a good scent. Stay on that track and and keep going with that. So yeah. Uh, endurance sweat was the question. There we go. Um, This is a a theoretical question again uh, from Theo. He says, what would happen if an unfit person did adaptive training with high volume, would they survive? So first of all, we have systems in place so that when, if you are a new athlete or uh, what in you, you phrase it as unfit athlete, but if you're like a new athlete, we're coming back to training and you select a high volume plan. We actually have systems in place to recommend low volume plans for those athletes. So first of all, it's probably unrealistic. Um, But that said, if a person did start doing a high volume plan and they were in that scenario, they just wouldn't progress as rapidly as another athlete would progress. It would be my assumption and adaptive training would be walking them through at their pace. That said, uh, once again, we've built in systems to avoid this situation so that athletes don't pick uh, volumes that that are too high for them. How I think of it is the same, like if an athlete picks all dot recommended workouts, will they get in trouble? Like, well, yeah, um, they probably will. Uh, and the system will update and be like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But if you keep doing it, even if we say, don't do it, like, don't come for us, please. Uh, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. At that point, there's a level of accountability and responsibility. Um, okay. Joel says, what about custom workout levels? Will these be updated to match the trainer road workout levels? So 
we talked about workout levels levels before and how ML analyzes the workout to be able to figure it out. Custom workouts are analyzed in a slightly different way. Um, it's a, it, it would be a long and confusing explanation that none of you want to listen to uh, in terms of me explaining exactly the mechanics of why that's the case. At some point, yes, we do want to, uh, uh, we, we do plan to address that, but that's, uh, yeah. that could very well be involved and solved in other things that we're, that we're fixing right now, or it could be something that we address separately. Yeah. So it does, uh, 99, uh, I can't say for absolutely sure. 90%. My confidence right now is 90% that with the outside stuff, custom workouts will be included in that. And that's what our approach is, is that we'll have one system to analyze all workouts. Uh, right. and that's what the, the goal is that. So we thought about, Hey, we could do something special for custom workouts but we thought it's probably better to go for the complete package at once with outside workouts and then get custom or then get custom, tweak it, wait for however long it takes to do that and then start working on outside workouts. I think everyone would, not everyone, a majority of athletes would rather have us nail the outside workout stuff and then get custom workouts than to have this more stepped release process. And for what it's worth, the differences between custom workouts and and train road library workouts. It's not profound. It's not like you were talking like a gigantic shift either. So, um, okay. Uh, Amir says due to personal circumstances, I'm only doing train now workouts rather than creating a training plan. Um, the danger with this is that I'm picking what I want rather than what I need. What are your thoughts on this? That's a, a it's a valid point, right? Yeah. Um, it, the thought is, uh, there's a mix of what are your goals? And what kind of, how much energy do you want to put into this? Because you can get, especially if you're raising your levels again, you can get way faster with train now, but if you want to be more like air quotes, optimal for a specific race day or, or season, um, I believe plan builder will be the better performance, but it also comes with the, the, um, commitment in order to do these things and to have this sort of stuff. And if your life does not fit into that. And maybe it's only a couple of weeks or maybe it's, it's months or maybe it's years. The better choice is to just train with how you feel and be motivated. It's so much better. I had this with Cape Epic kept getting pushed out. If you have a big race to come into that race, still motivated to train than to do so much where you get burnt out. And before the race starts, you wish it was over. That is a, a trap. I think. If you've been training for a few years, almost every athlete probably has had that where you bite off more than you can chew. You started too early. Uh, the race gets pushed out because of COVID over and over and over again. And your one year <laughs> build comes into a two and a half year build. Uh, those can be hard, right? So doing that train now can be a little bit, it can take away some of that me mental pressure and allow you to like training should be fun. Uh, and I'm going to say it's a mirror, right? It's cool to you don't have to be on that brink, that edge all the time. This is the same thing with nutrition too, right? If I always had to be on the edge of nutrition, everything has to be perfect. This, this is the same kind of way. It's like, Hey, is it okay to eat food? I enjoy Cause it's not optimal. We'd be like, yes, you can, <laughs> yes, you can eat food. Course. you enjoy. Like, like yeah. it's, it's a good thing. Um, and it'll make your life better and you'll probably become even faster. That is like the perfect training plan, right? Yep. To be able to have enjoyment inside of it. Yeah. You fly too close to the sun. You're bound to get burned with the fluctuations that life throws at you for sure. Patrick says, can a weekly plan adapt for a race once a week? Uh, for example, easy working on Friday because of a race on Saturday. So yeah, absolutely. Patrick, it's all built into the system. Uh, just make sure that those races are on your calendar. You can't expect adaptive training to be clairvoyant and it's not going to like, you know, it respects your privacy. It's not going to somehow like look into your calendar or something like that. So we, dope. we look at like yeah. race reg. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All across, yeah. we know your number and we like yep. plop it in automatically. Like you're, you can't pull us. Yeah. That'd be amazing. <laughs> so if you put the race on your calendar and then you use plan builder, when you're building out your training plan, there's an option where you can select, um, uh, use openers, uh, before your B and, uh, and a races. So that can be really helpful. Uh, if not, if you don't do that, I, I, advocate for this. And the more successful athletes podcasts we record, the more we see people following low volume athlete, low volume plans with great success. You can do a low volume plan. And then you can also just use train now on that day before that event to be able to do something easier or pick whatever workout you like to do. So there's tons of ways that you can do that. Uh, Patrick, what's the best way to do a different type of workout than the one scheduled example, the week before my recovery week, he says, I had to take off. So I didn't want to do all the endurance after a week off the bike. 
uh, workout alternates. That's the best way to be able to pick one. Um, straightforward. I hope we gave you enough information on workout alternates before. If not, there's resources, um, that we will have. You can look at the trainer road help center. There's tons of resources that you can get on that. Um, that can help with you. You also get onboarded everybody. When you open up trainer road, you'll get onboarded onto adaptive training. So you'll see it, whether you go to the website, open the app, anything else. So, um, okay. This question says, does adaptive training take into account any outside training, like doing CrossFit in between and scheduled training in trainer road? Does not. We not don't. Yet. We uh, we don't have a way to specifically measure those. Um, we have some ideas around it, and we're not going to. I I shouldn't say too much, but it, 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 we're thinking about it. But yeah, we don't know. So if you're if you're really nailing, like you're doing some multi sport thing where you're rowing five hours per week inside of it, you're going to have to have some personal responsibility and be as you feel like when you wake up, if you don't feel like training or your motivation's lower or you're super sore to either skip that day or to, um, go from a productive to an achievable, turn it down, shorter workout. And, uh, what that allows though, is the system will still, as long as you're giving that kind of honest feed input into it, the system's going to adapt and make sure mm -hmm. you stay on track, which is the important part. Um, but yeah, it's, it, we just need you to be able to be honest with yourself. For sure. Yep. It will still try to adapt everything for you, but if you're just tearing yourself apart in between your workouts and, uh, you're doing it every single time between your workouts, well, you can expect your workouts to not go well, right? That's pretty logical. Um, it'll yeah. try to make adjustments, but if you keep doing it to yourself, you know, you know what to do best in that case. <laughs> Um, okay. Next one, uh, for the post-workout surveys, I feel that I'm often between moderate and hard. Should I be choosing one over the other? Uh, once again, Justin, it's not about choosing one over the other. It's about how it feels for you. Um, that's a uh, moderate to hard. That's a common place for a lot of athletes to be able to fall, um, somewhere around there. And it's just up to you. Once again, responding moderate versus responding hard is not going to change things dramatically. Uh, so don't worry about that. Just try to be consistent. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, another question from Theo. He says, can adaptive training ever recommend when to add volume, uh, possibly in the future, it'd be great. Um, then it could say, Hey, looks like you could take on more or Hey, looks like you should take on less, which I actually think would be a whole lot more common with <laughs> type <A> athletes. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> the step that we need for that is the outside workout stuff because we mm -hmm. can't suggest more volume until we have fine grain understanding of all of your cycling training. Yeah. Uh, my heart rate monitor dropped during my last workout. So my heart rate data was low for the whole workout. Does that affect the adaptations? No. Nope. You're good there. Um, okay. Next one. What determines the progression levels and how do you know I'm getting better? So it's all based off of what you're doing, uh, Alexios, in this case, um, the progression levels are based off of the workouts that you've done. Now there may be a situation where for some reason you're a level two and you went and you just picked a level seven and you were able to nail it. Maybe it's like an energy system that you haven't addressed in a long time. Um, but maybe you're really naturally good at it. I don't know. If you go from that two to the seven, you'll likely see a spot where you won't suddenly be a seven. You might be something in between there. And that's because our system knows that those big shifts like that, sometimes you'll we can seven. get, are you sure? I'm positive hundred percent. You'll be a seven, okay. but what your next workout might be, might be different. Yes. Okay. There we yes. go. So yep. that's the, John has had some, there's some inside stuff that's happening that uh, I think John is describing, <laughs> but it's yeah. what you do. So if you, I think about weightlifting too, if you can bench 200 pounds, wow, you can bench 200 pounds. That doesn't mean your next workout. We want to put you at 210. Yeah. Maybe we want to sit you in there. Maybe we want to do higher reps at 180, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, the same thing with, if you can do an, 40 minutes at threshold, that doesn't mean we want to put you to 42 minutes at threshold the next workout. But we do want to tell you, hey, congratulations. You can now do 40 minutes at threshold. That next one might be two by 20. We, we don't know. It's going to depend on a lot of stuff. Uh, and that is why, um, that, that is how it, it works um, mm. with the display of uh, what your progression level is. Theo asks, do you ever anticipate that professional coaches will use their athletes' progression levels to determine if they will compete at certain events? No, because it like, well, so yes, coaches could look at it to understand a better understanding of how fit their athlete is. But if there is a coach 
unless you're just not trained at all, who goes, you know what, your anaerobic isn't high enough for this crit, just don't do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is probably not a coach that I would want because the experience of doing that event, like I've, I've gone to races thinking I'm going to get smashed and I've won too. Mm -hmm. It, you don't know who's going to show up. You don't know what's going to happen inside the race. There's race experience. There's so many benefits to a race where thinking that, Hey, my Whopper KG isn't here. So I'm not even going to participate or my level's not here. So I don't want to participate. I don't think that's, that should be done for anybody. Um, mm -hmm. there. I'm trying to think if there's some team aspect where there could be change a GC rider or something based on levels that could totally happen mm -hmm. where say John and I are the same weight, the same FTP. I'm a level two threshold. John's a level 10. They might change the GC rider from me to John because they're like, Hey, we, I know the FTP doesn't show up because of the workouts you've done recently. John's obviously the stronger rider. So we're going to support John now. And Nate, you're going to you're going to be a domestique for him. That could totally happen. But I don't think yep. any coach, especially for age groupers, should be like, yeah, you should just sit this one out. Yeah. Uh, yeah especially if you've been sure. working towards it. That I wouldn't want that coach. Yep. I agree with that. Uh, this one says, can adaptive training be useful for a track sprinter or kilo specialist? We, we've recommended that for track cyclists that they, so our gravity plan tends to be one that actually is a somewhat complementary profile for some track events, but not all. Um, and in that case, it will adapt for you and we'll work on that. Absolutely. But, uh, we are, we haven't built specifically for, like you said, kilo specialists, right? Like that's like not, um, that's not something that we've built for specifically. Uh, Mike says is the 20 minute could, FTP. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, John. You still could though. You understand that that's going to be mostly, uh, depending on your discipline, VO2 max anaerobic or, and or sprint. And mm -hmm. you could then use the level system work on those, have step progression inside of it, add your endurance work inside of it. You, you could do something custom uh, mm -hmm. based on what you understand, but it would be, I wouldn't say it's, we don't have a great system for someone who doesn't understand training to just like sit in there and be uh, an amazing track racer. Agreed. Yep. Yeah. You can work your way through it and levels helps a ton with that. Uh, Mike says, is the 20 minute FTP test obsolete or can we still use it if we like? I prefer it to the ramp test. Sure. Absolutely. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yep. And in this case, uh, adaptive training is going to work well with all of them and it's going to be able to further calibrate things for you. So it'll, it'll go, it'll go well. Uh, Kathy says, if I do a trainer road sprint workout, then extend the warm up and cool down to endurance. Will the endurance portion be counted, uh, in your progression? So will you get credit for the endurance portion of it? Not today, but in the, uh, workout, the outside workout stuff, that is part of the system that's going to be built into it. So for instance, you do two by 20 threshold, and then you added, I'll say something extreme, five hours of endurance. Today, you don't get credit for those five hours of endurance. Um, I mean, you could push yourself ahead in endurance the next time if you wanted to, but that is not included. And that is a, um, something that we want to add to the system, but also that's not very common. Like the most common thing right now is you do two by 20, maybe extend it 20 minutes. It's not enough to like really move your endurance levels inside of that. Uh, but again, with outside workouts, that is very common. I did a hill climb and then I rode for four hours. That happens all the time. And, uh, that's where we want to have that system to give you credit for multiple energy systems. And John, as John said too, it's like how you stack them up inside of the workout. Then you did the hill climb and you added some anaerobic kickups in the middle of it. Like, how does that adjust it? Um, it gets very complex and that is what we're trying to solve for. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, this might be the last question that we have and thanks to everybody for joining us. So uh, this has been fantastic. If you want to use adaptive training, go to trainerroad.com. uh, sign up. If you haven't yet, that's the best time ever to be able to do it. It's super exciting. And it's only going to improve from here. If your account has been, uh, if you've put it on hold for any period of time, go and sign up now. It's the time to do it. Uh, Mike says, how about other tests that do a panel where they'll test various different profiles for different durations? Well, those adjusted, uh, he says, like, how do those compare? And I want to be clear on this one. This is a really big difference. You don't have to like stress test yourself into the ground and test every possible duration to be able to figure this out. This is one of like, um, training is only effective if you do it right. And training is only effective if it's something that's realistic to complete moving forward as well. So if you have to do tests that are so arduous and completely run you down, that's not going to be something where you're actually going to get a good snapshot of your fitness on that day anyway. 
And then you're purely reliant on that one test that's very complicated to be able to guide everything there for or moving forward. So adaptive training just looks at what you're doing and looks at what you're able to do as you go. And then it makes those adjustments. That's why it's so good. That's also why we use the, why we did the ramp test, because on those tests where you test multiple energy systems, um, they are like duration specific where how hard can you go for this amount of time? So how, how hard can you go for five minutes? And you have to, when you start, you have to guess what your average power is going to be. And if you don't guess it right, the test isn't going to be valid because you're either going to go up a bunch or go down a bunch. Mm -hmm. And if you can guess it, why do the test at all? <laughs> yeah. uh, so what <laughs> happens is um, you can get a inaccurate measurement inside of all of those because it is the, you have to know what it is. 20 minute test too. That is why we went away from the 20 minute test, the ramp test is because hold for 20 minutes, even five watt difference inside of that can make a completely different outcome of what you're going to be. So that's why we did the ramp test to make it more consistent because it was that step thing. Um, it, you get put in the same way each time. But on top of that, if we did, it's like that, that measurement is once every, I don't know, you do four, six, eight weeks, whatever it is, that measurement is there. And then it doesn't adapt afterwards where maybe you haven't done VO2 max for a while. So it is low, but then once you get in like two or three workouts, it's like you increase your view to max very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's what our system wants to do is understand that it's not going to be linear in all systems in order to increase it. And also then you can see as you work out with the progression levels, these systems improving or these workout zones, I keep, please don't flame us. <laughs> we say, <laughs> yeah. we're using, we keep going back and forth in this and someone flamed us last time for this. Uh, even after I corrected myself, uh, we just cut yeah. this out and I'm sorry, <laughs> as you go through these workout zones, uh, it will, uh, you, you can see that you're getting better and yep. that is super duper important too. Or you can see if you're stagnating, that's the other, that's like the flip side of it or going down. Um, that could happen for people and mm -hmm. you got to look at your whole life about why it's happening. Yep. And, and it's also important to recognize that if your levels go down, that doesn't mean that it's a failure. That doesn't mean that it's bad. It's just what you need. Right. Yeah. So I've had that absolutely where I had a huge spike in life stress this year while I was going through a training plan. And suddenly I just could not do my workouts, uh, that I, that I thought I could do. So that week I wasn't able to complete a workout, filled out the survey data that next week I got easier workouts and it was or I, even that next workout because I had overlapping workouts in the same zone. I got easier workouts and I was able to complete them. And it's so nice to be able to know that whatever the numbers say, the workout feels like the right workout and it gives me what I need. And that's just awesome. Uh, that that's what we want. There's one more question from Victor. He says for a crit racer, you often talk about repeatability. Will adaptive training address this by focusing on level progression instead of just FTP increases via ramp tests. And absolutely Victor, the plans are designed to prioritize the sort of profile, power profile, like you said, in this case, Victor, that you need for that sort of event or that sort of training plan. So that means that, uh, so VO2 max, there's a lot of different types of VO2 max intervals, right? Those repeatable hard off on sort of intervals are key for crit racing. They're key for cyclocross, that sort of stuff. So in those plans, you'll notice that you aren't just going to get a VO2 max workout that's having you do four to five minute intervals, right? And replacing those on offs that you had with that. It's much more nuanced than that. It doesn't view a five minute VO2 interval the same as five minutes of off and on. It views those totally separately and it's really intelligent on how it can deal with that. So yeah, it'll prioritize what matters to you on race day, uh, Victor. And, super and cool. Re repeatability too is built into the difficulty metric. Because that is, I mean, it, there's a, a, a ton of stuff built into it, but it, that is, if you repeat more, it makes the workout harder. Mm -hmm. Sean, the last question that Sean Phillips has is he says, I'd love it if you could make for a nine day week as well. I could get so much more done. Um, we're working on that, Sean. <laughs> It'd be great if we could somehow make the week, the nine days and then add it onto the weekend even better. So um, just joking. We can't change calendars. That's just what it is. Okay. Uh, with everything. But what he's talking about is a nine day cycle. And yes, like we would love that too. I think he's actually talking about us changing that too. Um, oh, the, the calendar, okay. yeah, the actual yeah. calendar days. Yeah, the actual Everyone calendar. Everyone gets uh, two extra weekend days. Yeah, we'll love it. Yeah, mind. all for it. That's version three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Thanks everybody for joining us on this. I hope this gave you a lot of information on adaptive training. 
a favor that I would love to ask of you is to share adaptive training with people that you know. So other cyclists, talk to them about it, tell them to check it out and go to trainerroad.com. If you have a trainer road account and it's been, and it's been on hold for a while, renew, come back, give it a shot and test us, put Nate and I to the wood here and see if we actually are backing up what we're saying. It will make you faster. I promise you I'm confident in that we're all confident. And that's why we've shifted to this point. So go to trainerroad.com, sign up, tell your friends, maybe not the ones you want to beat, but tell your friends, get them there, get them to sign up for trainer road. And we'll talk to you all. I think, uh, let's see in another week uh, with coach Chad, we'll be back here to answer more stuff. Nate, John, this is key. Your friends get faster. You actually get faster too. This is true. This happens. If they progress, like your motivation goes up, that friendly competition with a true friend is awesome. If it's someone you're going to go national champions against, don't tell them. But they're probably <laughs> exactly. not your friend either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, tell everybody, get them to sign up, get them to check it out, get faster. Uh, if you have questions, go to the Trainer Road Forum. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you all next week with Coach Chad. More deep dives and exciting stuff to make you faster. Thanks, everybody. Check out Adaptive Training. Take care. Bye-bye.